in these stories in Matthew. We've been in Matthew this year as our gospel readings. And, and I've talked to you about this some before, that Matthew is writing to people who were regular members of the church. Now they happen to be Jews, and their church was a synagogue, and the temple in Jerusalem, but there is a direct parallel between the people that Matthew was writing to and those of us who have been in the church most of our lives, okay? They understood church, they understood doctrine, they had some understanding of the Bible, and then all of a sudden the rules changed because Jesus came along and said, it's not just about Jews. It's about, it's just like in Ezekiel where Ezekiel says, anyone who turns to, the do who turns to God will live. I have no pleasure in the death of anyone. Yeah. Turn then and live. So, so this, is, this is a change for them. This is a radical change for them. And it's just like in our own church, for those of us who are used to it, when suddenly we have people that we don't know or who aren't like us, who speak Spanish, maybe, who, who were raised as Pentecostals instead of staid Lutherans. I got to tell you a real quick story. One, uh, uh, there were a bunch of us who went on a, a marriage encounter, not marriage, yeah, marriage in endeavor. I don't know what, what a, some marriage retreat. There were six couples that went up, and the the couple that led the retreat were uh, uh, Nazarenes. And uh, they, they were very different when they prayed than most Lutherans because they were hands in the air and thank you, Jesus, and hallelujah, and praise you, God. And that, for, for those of you who've been in the Lutheran church for a while, that's not the way we pray. So the, the other couples that were there thought that was really cool and thought that they would do that the next Sunday when we were in church uh, and, and see if they could get the pastor. <laughs> except they couldn't quite do it. So instead, they all sat in the front row, and instead of uh, putting their hands in the air and saying, thank you, Jesus, in the middle of the sermon, they had little signs. <laughs> and they would sit there, and I would be preaching, and all of a sudden somebody would, not up here, but they would hold a sign about right here, thank you, Jesus. <laughs> and somebody else would hold one up and say, hallelujah. <laughs> they were outside their comfort zone. I mean, I think that's a silly story, but it's kind of illustrative of we get used to church as we understand it, those of us who are here for, for more than six weeks in a row. And, and that becomes what we understand to be the way relationship with God is. So that's what's going on with the, with the uh, people that uh, St. Matthew was writing to. And they're, and they're dealing with these, this whole new population that's coming in who are not like them. And it's a problem. And so Jesus basically, there are two themes that you can take from Matthew, and we've been hitting really hard the theme that uh, we are all disobedient children, because that's where Matthew establishes the common ground. Wait a minute. Just because you know the rules of church doesn't make you better than somebody who doesn't. What makes you better is that Jesus died for your sins. That's the baseline. And that's, so the first theme is we're all disobedient children. And we've kind of been hitting that one for the last weeks. But the other side of that equation is that God always loves us. And that Jesus Christ came among us so that we would know that God loves us so much that he would let us murder him and not strike back. That he, would, he rose from the dead without accusations against us but only to ask us, look, the only thing that matters is do you love me? Because I love you. And you matter to me. And this is how far I will go to let you know how much I love you. Now the only issue here is do you love me? It ain't about being Lutheran or charismatic. It's none of that stuff. It's not about being a good Jew or a Gentile convert. It's about God loves you. Do you love me? And if the answer to that is yes, Lord, you know that I love you, like Peter says later on, then 
Jesus says, now I have something for you to do. Do you love me? Yes, I love you. Okay, now I want you to find a way to share that with other people. So the first thing that's going on in this story is that he is saying to these presumptuous leaders of the church, by the way, the pastors and the elected leaders and all of those, he's, they say to him, uh, so where do you get off talking the way, this way to everybody and stirring up the crowds? Who the heck do you think you are? And he nails them and he says, well, uh, why did you think of John the Baptist, that other rogue preacher? that thousands of people went out to see and about you who, uh, who said about you, you brood of vipers, you snakes in the grass. So where'd he get his authority? This is what Jesus does. He always pulls the rug out from under people who are, who are too big for their britches. It really, that, it's, it's the truth, including us. Whenever we get too big for our britches. Who do you think you are? Okay, you want to know where I get my authority? Well, what do you think about John the Baptist? And man, do they get political, don't they? They get in a huddle, and they get in their little groups, and, and you heard what they said. The one says, uh, oh, well, if we say his authority was from God, then he's going to ask why we didn't follow him. A good question. But if we say he wasn't from God, then too many people will vote against us. Now, that's not what it says here, but that's a, a concept that we would understand about how leadership sometimes works to take the easiest path so they don't have to accept authority, they don't have to accept consequences. Is, is this not true? Is that not the way the world seems to work, at least in, in our uh, sphere of, of governance? And Jesus says, okay, you can't answer a simple question. And you want me to give you that kind of information? You're not going to tell me? I don't have to tell you. But I will tell you this, says Jesus. Whoever comes to me as whoever listened to John the Baptist, whoever comes to me goes into the kingdom of heaven first. What's interesting here is he's not saying that these other people aren't going to go to heaven. It's just that they make it awfully difficult. And maybe God has to do some correctives with them before they get there. I don't, I don't know how God's going to handle that. It's above my pay grade. I just know that God says he will. Or she will, depending on your point of view. But Jesus says this. God says this in Ezekiel. I have no pleasure in the death of anyone. God is not a vindictive God. Some of us were raised in churches in which what you did was more important than what you believed. And you really were judged on your faith and your faith meant how you behaved. And if you didn't behave properly, you couldn't belong. Maybe you weren't actually kicked out of the church. Maybe you were just marginalized or encouraged to keep quiet about who you were. Well, Jesus says that's not the operative question that God is going to ask when we face God face to face. The question that God asks of you and me is simply this. Do you love me? Then turn away from the things that destroy your life. Turn away from the things that sap love and, and, and harmony out of relationships. Turn away from the things that tarnish us. Have you, ever, have you ever had that sense of your life just being dull? Now, I don't, I don't, mean, you're, I don't mean by that that you're bored. But it's just, I mean, if you've ever had, if you've ever polished silverware, you know, it, it gets this tarnish on it. And it just covers up the beauty of, of this, of this uh, element, this silver element. And it really takes intentionally wiping it off 
in order for the beauty to shine forth. Has your life ever been like that? Where you're just getting by, sort of, and there's not any real joy that the love that you had between you maybe becomes more habit than joy, whether that's a marital love or friends or brothers and sisters or whatever it is. I think that that's what God is talking about in Ezekiel and Jesus is trying to press home that look, God doesn't want our lives to be tarnished. God doesn't want our lives to be joyless. Turn away from those things that sap life out of us and return to the Lord who does not desire the death of anyone. Turn means repent. That's the religious phrase a lot of us are familiar with. Turn away from those things and return back to the one who is the eternal presence of joy. That all joy resides in God and comes from God and is poured out on us freely. Here's one of the saddest stories that I've ever seen. When my grandmother died, we all went back to Springfield, Illinois to bury her. And we went to the graveyard and, uh, and uh, we had the graveside, had the funeral in the graveside service. And there was this little old woman who was by the graveside and she was weeping. We, I mean, she was not just crying. I mean, it was like sobbing at the graveside of my grandmother. And so we all got in the cars to go back to Grandma and Grandpa's house, you know, for the lunch afterwards. And, and, I, and I asked my mom, who was that? Oh, she said, I don't remember exactly what the relationship was, whether it was an in-law relationship or, uh, it, I think it was an in-law relationship to my, to my grandmother. So it would have been on my grandfather's side. And 55 years ago, they got in an argument. And she refused to ever be reconciled with my grandmother. And she held whatever the heck that argument was, they probably didn't even remember what it was, held that as, as a core of her relationship with grandma for 55 years. And at the graveside, realized that now it was too late, that there could never be reconciliation. There could never be peace. Isn't that just plain stupid? But isn't that the way we behave towards each other sometimes? And I believe it's exactly what Jesus is confronting with all of the things that we make so important that are actually peripheral. The fences we put up to keep others out. When Jesus says, come unto me, all you, like I said to the children, come unto me, all you who are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Learn from me about giving it up and letting God be God in your lives so that you can end up having the joy of the Holy Spirit that binds us together and makes the whole so much greater than the sum of the parts. Yes? Do you see that? We're all disobedient children. I mean, <laughs> think, about, think about these two boys. Aren't they a couple of charmers? Go out and work in the vineyard. No, I'm not going to go. Oh, well, I guess I better do it anyway. And at least the job got done, right? Oh, Dad, of course I'll go out until you turn your back, and then I'm going to go play with my friends. I don't know which of those camps you fall into. But I know that Jesus is saying to each and every one of us today, <laughs> stop, stop doing that. Accept the joy of the Lord. Love God. And in loving God, learn how to love each other. Couldn't we work at that just a little bit better? I'm going to go home. I'm going to go home today. And maybe for at least an afternoon, I'll be nicer to my wife. 
because, because Jesus has been nicer to me. And maybe if I can keep that in front of me, I'll be just a little bit more decent in my behavior towards others, eh? You think? And may the peace of God, which passes our understanding, stand a guard over our hearts as we do that. In Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen. Well, it's a light of mine. I'm going to let it shine. It's the light of mine. I'm going to let it shine. It's the light of mine. I'm going to let it shine. Every day, every day, every day, every day, every day, every day, I let my little light shine. Oh, Jesus gave me light. I'm going to let it shine.